Throughout human history, we've unearthed artifacts and structures that continue to baffle experts. Some researchers, pushing the boundaries of conventional archaeology, propose extraterrestrial explanations for these enigmatic finds. From the precise engineering of the pyramids to the intricate Nazca lines, this video explores controversial theories that suggest alien involvement in ancient human civilizations. We'll examine the evidence that has led some to question mainstream historical narratives and consider otherworldly origins. But as we delve into these fascinating claims, we'll also address the importance of scientific rigor in interpreting archaeological evidence. A pit full of arms. I don't think anything nice was ever found at the bottom of a pit. No one has gone to the base of a pit and found a PlayStation 5 with The Last of Us 3. It's almost always death and this pit was no different. Some archaeologists in France came across a super deep pit. Like if you fell in it, you would die 100% of the time. There's no way you're sticking that landing, not at all. So it makes sense at the bottom of this pit they found a bunch of skeletons from people who had been thrown into the pit. It was Death Pit, which is the name of the metal band I'm going to start after this video. Now the thing that was so shocking about the bodies that were thrown into this pit of despair is what happened to the bodies before they were thrown into the pit. All the people had their arms chopped off and their skulls bashed in. Like you're already going to throw the people to their death. Why would you mutilate their bodies before you chuck them in? The pit was literally layered. At the bottom layer was all arms and the top layer was all bodies that had their heads smashed in. Like some sort of sick cake. Who would do such a thing? Well the bodies were dated back to 4000 BC, so their motivations were very unknown, but it's probably just because they were cavemen. At number nine, we have the black sarcophagus. This is my problem with archaeologists. They're always digging around finding things that maybe don't want to be found. Maybe something was buried 20 feet underground because it was never supposed to be opened ever again, like the black sarcophagus. This thing was dug up in 2018, and right away people were saying that this thing was cursed. It got posted all over the internet and it's spread around like a mid-tier meme. Like you know the kind of meme that lasts for like two or three weeks at best? Like when you look at it you just blow air out of your nose and then move on? Like that kind of meme. It wasn't great. Well everyone said that this thing was going to rain fire from the sky if it was ever opened. I mean and it does look like something pulled right out of a movie. And guess what the archaeologists did anyways? They opened it. Oh this creepy box that might kill everyone? Let's just open it just in case. There might be a boat in there, who knows? Now nothing can be connected directly to the sarcophagus, but remember how much people were complaining about 2019? and saying a bunch of bad stuff happened? Coincidence? I think not. At number eight, we have head on your chest. How do you want to die? This might be something you want to pick because it's the only thing in life that you can guarantee. I want to die on TV saying something cool so my death quote gets turned into a meme like a hundred times. It's like all over the internet. I want my death to be turned into like an infinity war level meme, like a huge level meme. Also side note, Thanos did nothing wrong. But I don't think that these guys got to pick their death. There were some weird bodies that were discovered in England. They were dated back to the 14th century. The weird thing about these bodies that they were all buried laying flat with their heads propped up on their chest like they were holding a basketball. Which means that someone was chopping off these dudes heads before before they sent them into the ground. Not the most fun way to die, but at least they got to keep their head. They didn't start kicking it around like a soccer ball or something. If I was one of the guys in charge, I would bury them, but I would switch their heads around so the person finding them would have to do a match game to match up the right heads. At number seven, we have puzzle time. Did you know that if you throw a person's body into a bog and it's cold enough, it will help preserve the body? Well, I didn't know this either until I started making this list. Well, there was a dude in Scotland who found some bodies that had been buried for hundreds of years, but it seemed like before they were buried, someone had been doing some bog therapy on them to keep them in a preserved state. This is slightly creepy, but let's kick it up a notch. There were two bodies found, a man and a woman. Both of their bodies were very strange. There were limbs and body parts that seemed to be too large for their frame, almost like it was some some sort of mutation. Everyone was confused. Well, thanks to the magic of DNA, the people digging up these bodies were able to find out that this happened because someone had been taking different body parts from several dead bodies and assembling them to make some sort of creation. Very creepy. And some of the mismatched body parts were hundreds of years older than the others. How did someone find bodies that were hundreds of years old and why did they try to attach them to other people's bodies? That's something we will never know. At number six, we have the cheese. Usually people digging around in Egypt want to find a gold tomb that is filled with guys wrapped in toilet paper. But every now and again you find something a little more strange. A tomb in Egypt had a little snack inside waiting to be dug up. Why would this be on a list of scary things? Well because the cheese was over 3000 years old and it was packed with some unknown bacteria. If someone was dumb enough to bite into this cheese they could unleash a plague that could wipe out humanity as we know it. Death would sweep through the world and ravage every 
last man, woman, and child. There would be nowhere on earth that you would be able to be safe from the terrors of this bloody cheese. People would become cheese monsters, like all the creatures that walk around in The Last of Us, except they would smell like Parmesan. Well, either that or the dude would just get the worst diarrhea of his life, like poop water for like eight weeks straight or something. Really, either is possible when you weigh it out. At number five, we have Wolverine Ish. For this next one, it really depends on what part of the store you look at to whether or not this will be a nightmare to you. So in Italy, a body was found from someone who seemed to be from the 8th century. He was a pretty old dude, and this guy had his arm chopped off right above the elbow. Now that is the scary part, someone amputating part of your body. No one wants to have their arm chopped off at any joint. But in place of his missing forearm was a big knife. This guy had a stump, and then at the end of it was an engineered prosthetic that had a knife on it. He had a knife hand, which I think is cool as as hell. This guy could be walking around in the year 800 punch stabbing people like a G. Punch stab, punch stab, punch stab, punch stab, punch stab. This guy's cool as hell. But I can understand why that would scare people because you never want to be on the bad end of a guy punch stabbing you. At number four, we have a gnawing sensation. The body of a Roman woman had a little surprise in her nether regions. And let me tell you, it's not a sexy one. Not everything below the bell gets hot. In fact, this was one of the most gross things that has ever been discovered. And I never want to come in contact with anything like this ever again. Well, this lady was found with a tumor in her pelvis. Elvis. What was crazy about is that the tumor was caused by an infected egg inside of her womb. This would cause the egg to partially develop and the tumor had teeth in it. Ugh. That sounds like something that should be pulled out of a horror movie. The living tumor that has come to take over your planet. You will all be slaves to this toothy monster. Because this lady happened to die before x-rays were even a concept, there's a good chance she had no idea what dental danger was inside her body. At number three, we have vampires. As much as we complain about the world, it's nice to know that things used to be way worse. Like maybe you don't like your your job, or maybe you were stuck in traffic, or maybe even got dumped. But at least you weren't tortured to death because people thought you were a vampire. A tomb in Bulgaria uncovered a man from the 1200s who'd seemed to be horribly murdered, most likely by people who thought he was some sort of vampiric monster. It seemed that he was forced into a grave, and then someone took a bladed weapon to his leg and hacked it off. And because the only way to kill a vampire is to stab it through its heart, they hammered a steel stake through this dude's chest, pinning him to his own grave. Joke's on them, you have to use a wooden stake. So this guy rose from the dead to to seek revenge. Just kidding, he died for sure. He was for sure dead. At number two, we have Pit of Sorrow. Something this list has taught me is that things have definitely got nicer over time. I know the world isn't perfect, but this next point shows how commonplace brutality used to be. There was a pit found in Austria that had an entire tribe of people in it. 94 bodies were found and they were all dated back to 5200 BC. Now how did all these people from the tribe die in the same place? Well they were attacked and from the looks of it, it seemed like the opposing tribe came in to wipe them all out. Everyone in the pit had their head cracked open and then had their knees and legs snapped and some of them had arrowheads lodged in their backs. The thing that sent this over the edge is that 27 of the 94 bodies were children. This tribe, the attacking tribe made sure that everyone was dead except for women. There were only two female bodies found in the gravesite, so this most likely means that the women were all taken into slavery. All right, for the number one spot, we have some hidden tunnels that were dug up in Chavin de Huantar in Peru. The tunnels zigzagged into all sorts of hidden rooms that could have been used as some sort of hiding place or escape route from invading tribes. But it seemed that the main thing that the tunnels were used for was sacrificing people in rituals. Several bodies were discovered that were dismembered in all sorts of strange ways. They would be strapped down to altars and then mutilated to death. Some of them had their heads chopped off and others seemed to have their hearts pulled out of their chest while they were still alive. Imagine someone putting a bag over your head in the middle of the night and then dragging you to some horrible underground lair and then cutting your still beating heart out of your chest. That's one hell of a Friday night. And we're starting things off with the discovery of possibly the oldest art in the world. Now the common belief is that Homo sapiens were the first human species to create art. But a finding in 2014 showed that that may not have been the case at all. Archaeologists may have found ancient art created by not our species, but by our distant ancestor, Homo erectus. Previously, we thought that the earliest evidence of sophisticated art dated back around 70 to 100,000 years ago, crafted by Homo sapiens. But in 2014, a shell engraved with geometric patterns was discovered in a riverbank in Indonesia. It was dated to be at least 430,000 years old and believed to have been made by Homo erectus. So Homo erectus was never thought to have been artistic in any way. Now, am I saying the art on this shell was like a breathtaking piece? No, I mean it zigzags 
etched into a shell, but it's pretty cool that this may have been created by an extinct species of human. This pushes back the timeline for complex cognitive abilities much further than we thought before, and it changes the idea that modern human behavior, in this case artistic expression and abstract thought, just suddenly came about in a burst of evolutionary innovation around 100 to 200,000 years ago. Instead, it looks like some of what we consider modern may have been around in our ancestors hundreds of thousands of years earlier. And speaking of extinct human species, there are also recent findings that point to Homo naledi possibly being more intelligent than we thought and doing stuff like burying their dead. Originally discovered in a South African cave system, these 300,000 year old hominins were thought to have had a mix of human and pre-human features, but not much else. But Recent evidence points to them having possibly been way more complex than we thought before. There's evidence that Homo naledi may have intentionally buried their dead. The idea has always been that only modern humans did that. Even more interesting are the engravings found on cave walls. Now, the age of the marks hasn't been determined to a T. If they were created by Homo naledi, it would mean they would have a level of artistic expression and brain power that, once again, we thought was unique to Homo sapiens. Now, to be fair, Homo naledi had uh, very small brains, so that's just not just us being arrogant. It makes sense that we always thought they were just kind of dumb apes. Next up, we have new revelations about the hunting practices of foraging society. So here's what we've always been taught in school, right? The men in ancient tribes would always be the ones out hunting while the women stayed home. And it turns out that may not be the case. Now, while it is true that men would have been hunting the majority of the time, there's recent evidence that points to women having hunted in about 80% of foraging societies around the world. And in a third of those societies, women were even taking down big game. So this particular finding started with a comprehensive review led by Carl Well Scheffler at the University of Washington, who delved deep into over 1,400 human societies societies worldwide, spanning over 150 years of studies. Now, as for why we haven't really heard much about this before, it seems there's just been a bit of a bias. The idea that men are the hunters and women stick to gathering has been so ingrained in our minds that it's just always how evidence has been interpreted. But now with this wealth of data, it's becoming more clear that women have been active participants in the hunt all along. What's also really fascinating is how flexible women's hunting strategies were. They weren't confined to one tool or method. They were using bows and arrows, knives, nets, spears, and in some cases, they were even hunting with their young strapped to their backs. Next up, we have a discovery made in 2023 of a very old Viking burial, really changing our understanding of Scandinavian history. So this mound, known as Harlog Shagen, was believed to be a typical Viking Age burial site. But turns out there's more to it than that. Surveys of the mound uncovered large rivets, which confirmed that this was the site of a ship burial. Now, that's not surprising on its own. Cool, but not surprising. This is Scandinavia, after all. What is surprising, though, is the date. It was dated to around 700 AD, which predates the Viking Age by several decades. This makes Harlashagen the oldest known ship burial in Scandinavia, and it means that the tradition of burying people in large ships began much earlier than historians once thought. It also shows that the maritime skills and technology of the region were more advanced than we thought before as well, even before the Viking Age. Next on the list, we have the Diary of Merer. It used to be a pretty common belief that the Great Pyramids were built by slaves, being yelled at and whipped as they uncomfortably hauled massive mounds of limestone, but this version of events may not be accurate, and it all changed with the discovery of the Diary of Merer, an ancient papyrus with details about how the ancient Egyptians built these structures and the lives of the workers who built them. Merer was an official who oversaw a team responsible for transporting limestone blocks from quarries to the construction site of the Great Pyramid of Giza. His diary, dated to around 4,500 years ago, had all these meticulous details of the daily operations involved 
in this construction. What's surprising is that Mara's diary mentions the workers being well fed and cared for, contradicting that image we have of brutal slavery often thought to be the case. Instead of slaves, it looks like the builders were skilled laborers and may have actually been compensated for their work. So uh, there you go. Now you can rest easy at night knowing one of the seven wonders of the world was built in an ethical way. Unless he was just lying in all those writings to make it all look better for like people discovering it in the future, you know? News of this next archeological breakthrough was just released in 2023. And for those of you not keeping track of time, that's last year. So human fossils were found in the Tam Pa Ling cave in Laos that may change researchers' understanding of human migration into Australia. These fossils were found buried deep in the cave's sediment layers, giving us very important evidence that links the journey of early humans from Africa through South East Asia and eventually into Australia. The common belief has always been that human migration happened mostly through sea routes, but these human remains were found in a cave 186 miles inland in 2009, so that had scientists second guessing things. Using luminescence dating techniques, researchers were able to figure out a timeline, revealing the oldest fossils could have been between 68 and 86,000 years old, which pushes back the estimated arrival of humans in Southeast Asia by quite a bit. The findings could also mean that modern humans likely traveled through forested areas, possibly following river valleys on their journey from Africa to Asia and eventually to Australia. Were all the high-ranking members of society in ancient Europe always men? History has always taught us that was the case, but it turns out that Bronze Age Spain may have had women in powerful positions. Back in 2021, a pretty cool discovery was made in Spain. The discovery was of a woman's remains, and it looked like she'd been a ruling elite. Located beneath a Bronze Age ruin at a site in Murcia, Spain, the woman had been buried along with valuable objects, like a rare silver crown. There were also the remains of a man buried along with her, and uh, he didn't have anything cool on him. He was just a bunch of bones. This this ruin was also found to have possibly been the earliest palace discovered in Western Europe from the Bronze Age. The crown wasn't the only evidence that this woman had been in a position of power. It was also the location of her burial. She'd been beneath a room with a large building complex that looked to have been both residential and political. Basically, the place could have been a palace. Next on the list, we have the bronze statues. So in 2022, statues dating back 2,300 years were discovered, and they were unlike anything seen before in Italy or even the Mediterranean. Led by archeologist Jacob Taboli, the excavation team found 24 beautifully preserved bronze statues, including figures of gods like Hygieia and Apollo. They were also adorned with inscriptions honoring important Etruscan families. It looked as if the statues might might have been submerged in the thermal waters as part of some religious ceremony, which helped keep them in such fantastic condition over the centuries that people of that time had been praying together and honoring their gods in these ancient baths. Now, what was fascinating about this discovery is that it looks like the Etruscans and Romans may have been closer than what we once thought. Next on the list, we have the possible discovery, heavy emphasis on possible, the possible discovery of Amelia Earhart's plane. So you probably heard about this in the news about a month back. People are pretty excited about this one. And if it does turn out that Amelia Earhart's plane has been found, this will put an end to a decades old mystery. A man named Tony Romeo, the CEO of Deep Sea Vision, led a team to the Pacific Ocean close to Howland Island where they captured sonar images using an underwater drone. They scanned 5,200 square miles of the ocean floor, and they captured what looks to be an aircraft looking similar to Amelia Earhart's Lockheed 10E Electra. Now, some say the wings, or what look like wings in the sonar image, look different than Earhart's plane. They're kind of like backward. And sure, there's totally a chance this is a different aircraft, but the wings could have also been damaged, and that's why they look to be bent back like that. At this point, we really don't know, but there's going to be an expedition later this year to see if this really is her plane. So we just gotta hold out for a little while. And we're finishing off today's list with a pretty incredible discovery made in Brazil. It all started in 2019 when a team of archaeologists were called in to inspect what seemed like a routine construction project at an apartment complex. But as they dug deeper, 
they stumbled on human bones along with this trove of ancient relics. And it all dated back thousands of years, some as far as 9,000. And there were over 100,000 artifacts in total along with 43 human skeletons. And what was also really interesting is that these findings spanned layers of history. Each layer was a different civilization that once lived in the region. About six and a half feet below the surface, archaeologists discovered remnants of a group that existed around eight to 9,000 years ago. And this was incredibly interesting because it pushed back the timeline of humans settling in Brazil by quite a bit. The team's been working for four years at the site, and this finding could rewrite history, changing what anthropologists used to believe about when humans migrated into the Americas from Asia. At number 10, we have King Henry IV's head. I want to be such a badass in my life that when I die, people put in such an effort to make sure I stay dead. Either that or they do some sort of weekend at Bernie situation with strings on me and I'm dancing around. Well, when King Henry IV was assassinated, they cut off his head and buried it in another location. The location was a mystery to everyone until 2010 when it was found in some tax collector's attic. The dude had a 17th century cranium stored up there like old baby pictures. This guy bought it off an elderly couple. The elderly couple snagged the head in an auction in the late 19th century. Okay, I want to add to what I want to live like. I want to be such an awesome person in my life that people are selling my body parts off at an auction. It'll be like, next up, we got Che Dorena's prize scrotum. It said that if you pull off one of the hairs, any wish will come true. Coming in at number nine is the tiny alien, and yes, I found this one after pulling one of those scrotum hairs and wishing on it. Honestly, I don't even know with this one. So back in 2003, in the Atacama Desert of Chile, archaeologists found a six-inch tall mummified skeleton with a pointed head. And if you see the picture of this thing, it's actually tiny, like it's the size of my foot, more or less. And, and now I can't tell if I've exposed that my feet are big or that this thing was tiny. My feet are normal sized, I swear. Either way, after close examination, researchers found the skeleton to have the bone density of a six year old kid, despite its miniature size. Even scientists were like, could this be our first ever alien specimen? Sadly not. After more and more thorough investigation, they found out the skeleton was in fact human after all, probably related to the indigenous Chileans. There were seven different mutations in her growth genes, which most likely explains her overall smallness, but it is a sight to see. Honestly, I've never seen a skull shape like that, and I'm not throwing shade at all. It's it's interesting. All right, your favorite host is back, or back with number eight, head on a stick. Way back in the day when we were still swinging around clubs and we didn't really know what to do with dead bodies. Cremating someone and then throwing their ashes over the parking lot at Cheesecake Factory by their request is a very new thing. Well, these Stone Age dudes thought taking heads and mounting them on sticks was the best course of action. An archaeological dig in Sweden found a bunch of heads mounted on sticks that dated back way before the Greeks were laying around with rock hard abs. It's unknown why these cavemen decided to shish kebab these skulls. They might have been enemies and mounting the heads to sticks could have been a warning to other people not to come around or you're going to end up like this head on a stick. Or it could have been a nice thing. Maybe when your buddy dies you put his head on a stick so you can bring him around and give him little forehead kisses forever. It did seem like some sort of ritual because where they found the mounted heads, the were loads of animal bones scattered everywhere. Filling our number seven slot is the Apple Store. And no, I'm not about to mention the 13th century Apple Store that archaeologists randomly found, and with it, the iPhone minus 10C or X or whatever you want to call it. So basically, back in 2013, the company was breaking ground in Madrid in order to build another Apple Store because clearly they thought they didn't have enough. While construction crew were excavating the area, they found the remnants of a 15th century hospital just casually. The hospital was in use way back in the 1400s and treated victims of the plague. It was demolished in 1854 and sealed below the street until the Apple Store came along. When asked about the situation, Apple said they want to incorporate the ruins of the hospital into the glass box store design. So, you know, if you walk into the Madrid store, you'll find the iPhones on your left, earpods on your right, and the hospital ruins and corpses way at the back. Do ask for assistance from an employee if need be. And I am your favorite host. 
Back again, guys, with number six, smallpox scabs. You go to the library and you try to make your brain smarter. And then the only thing that happens is you come in contact with an ancient disease. You pause your Netflix and pick up books only to get punished for it. This is like when there was E. coli in the romaine lettuce. Well, in 2003, Suzanne Caro went to check out some books at the Santa Fe College Library. She picked out some old Civil War books because she's a fun time. And in the book, there was an envelope. Because she's a curious little devil, she decided to open them up and found a bunch of scabs. Scabs in an envelope? Must be my birthday. She found out by reading this old timey book that the scabs were taking off patients with smallpox during the Civil War. So she kept them, then dipped them in chocolate and served them to her friends at a dinner party. I'm just kidding guys, she called the Center for Disease Control because she's not as imaginative as I am. Coming in at number 5 is the letter. During the demolition of a fireplace in a house located in Cavisham, builder Lewis Shaw found a letter. The letter was written sometime in the 40s by a little boy called David. I know you were hoping it was like some sort of murder confession letter or a steamy cheating confession, but alas, it was just a letter to Santa Claus. In it, he wrote, Dear Father Christmas, that was quite formal. Anyway, Dear Father Christmas, please can you send me a Rupert annual and a drum box of chalks, soldiers and Indians slipping and any little toys you have to spare. Love, David. Well, any little toys you have to spare, how cute is that? Like, mate, he has a factory run by elves. He has more than a little to spare. Lewis really wanted to track David down to give him the letter, so he actually made a hashtag find David media campaign and actually managed to find him alive and well. The internet. There you go. You'd assume David would have been like, bro, I wrote this 60 years ago, you think I care now? But he was actually quite surprised and found it quite cute considering his kids now either asking for a motorbike or a bunch of Barbies. Chalk and slippers just won't cut it in this day and age, David. Get with it. At number four on the list, we have the Essex Sarcophagus. A Stephen Drake was checking out an old home in the middle of being touched up. While walking through, he came to a big gap in the wall. He decided to peek through. Now, if this was a horror movie, this would be the point where something jumps into his eye and sucks out his brain. But instead of having his brain sucked out, he found a 3,000 year old sarcophagus that was left there by the previous owner. The guy who used to own the home was now dead, so Stephen took the sarcophagus to get carbon dated, and it turns out the thing was legit. I hope Stephen got a Fat payday for that. Some weird stuff about this is no one knows where the dead owner got this thing from, and there also was no body inside the sarcophagus, so no one knows where the mummy body went. Filling on number three slot is the baby. I can't even wrap my head around why someone would even do this or how they would do it, but here we go. Back in 1850, a Parisian couple were getting some work done on their home. Workers came in and started digging up the floor and walls, and a mummified baby just fell out of the wall. Legit, they were probably like is this yours? Obviously the couple was suspected of killing the baby right away but they were quickly exonerated. The doctor used changes in corpses and flies to determine they didn't do it. First off, how on earth do you put a baby dead or alive in a wall? Forget dead, how do you have the heart to put a live baby in a wall and board it back up? Secondly, how are flies good murder conviction evidence? Like, am I the only one that thinks this is sus? This is sus, guys. And sadly enough, cases of mummified babies are so common even even now, I mean two were found in 2007 and those are just the two that I know of. I'm sure if I researched it more I'd find a bunch. This just, this just hurts my heart, I'm sorry. Che is here for comic relief and I'm here for the morbid stories. Hey guys, I'm back to bring a smile to your face after Eamon bummed you out. On number two, we have the mass grave of Tomb County Galway. Okay, maybe I'm gonna bum you out too. In an archaeological dig, I bet you wanna find like dinosaur bones or old weaponry, maybe even some fossilized dinosaur poop. That's a real thing, you should look it up. Underneath the former home for single mothers in Tomb County, Ireland, was the remains of 796 babies. What the hell? It was a super baby grave. This is like something that came out of a Rob Zombie movie. Like it's literally almost House of a Thousand Corpses. Between the years of 1925 and 1961, the home was run by the Bon Secure nuns, and it was a place where single mothers could go to get support. However, the nuns would often neglect the children which they were left to take care of. This would lead to them dying, and then they would wrap them in a sheet and dump their bodies in a septic tank. When the discovery was made, a home was built over top of the burial site to pay homage to the infants. That was so chilling, I never want to think about it again. Now we gotta go back to Eamon. Oof. Hi guys, I'm back. Hopefully you don't find me as dull as Jay thinks you do. And finally, at number one is post-death partum. 
So yeah, you probably do find me as dull as Jay thinks you do. Once upon a time, 1,300 years ago, in a small Italian town of Imola, a woman died. And that's the end of number one. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Archaeologists found said woman in 2010 and the skeletal remains seemed odd. Her skeleton was fine, but archaeologists found a strange cluster of tiny bones in between her legs, which obviously turned out to be the remains of her fetus that she somehow gave birth to after her death. If we investigate this further CSI style, she was buried face up, so that implied she was purposely buried. She was in her late 20s, early 30s, and her baby was only two weeks away from being full term. The baby's legs were still inside the mum, but their head and upper body was born after she died, and that's referred to as a coffin birth. Did you guys know that was a thing? Because I certainly did not know that was a thing. What happens is that a gas builds up inside the dead woman, which pushes the fetus out of the birth canal, something that has rarely ever been seen in archaeological history. And that's not even the end of it. They also found a hole drilled into the woman's skull, which is common back then to relieve things like head injuries, headaches, or to get rid of evil spirits. If any of you need that treatment after listening to Che, hit me up. Starting off this countdown, we have the Sinners. During construction near Oxford United Football Stadium, workers discovered a very creepy burial ground. The burial site had around 100 skeletons and it's thought that they were 600 to 900 years old. The bones included someone with leprosy, someone who suffered a blunt force trauma, and a woman buried face down. What came of most interest to researchers was this woman. Typically, women were buried face down if they were an accused witch or if they were a sinner. Researchers believe that this woman was actually a nun who was accused of getting it on with the priests. It was thought that if you bury any sinners face down, then this prevents the impure soul from threatening the living. Hence why she was buried face down. Moving on to number nine, we have the vampires. During the construction of a roadway near Gliwice in Poland, they came across what they thought were the remains of World War II soldiers. However, upon investigating, it was discovered that the remains belonged to vampires. Well, people who were accused of being vampires. They found that their heads had been chopped off and then placed on their legs. This was done to ensure that the dead stayed dead. Others were found with punctured spines or their heads wedged between heavy stones. Again, this was all preventative measures done to ensure that the vampires don't rise out of their graves. But these vampires were mainly people who suffered from diseases or deformities, which caused them to behave strangely. And strange or unusual behavior meant that you were evil. In our 8th spot, we have the Neanderthal family. Archaeologists in Spain discovered the remains of a family of 12 Neanderthals. But sadly, this family succumbed to a tragic fate around 49,000 years ago. The bodies were found with marks all over their bodies, leading researchers to believe that they were killed by a cannibalistic Neanderthal family. Yep, they were eaten alive by another family. So the bodies had thin slashes on their bones from tools, thought to be from the cannibals hitting the bones to break them, and then they would feast on the bone marrow. Then evidence suggests that when they were finished, they used the victim's bones to sharpen the edge of their own tools. In our seventh spot, we have the Screaming Mummies. The first Screaming Mummy was found in 1886 by Dier El Bari. We call it the Screaming Mummy because the mummy was found with its mouth hanging wide open, looking like it was screaming. Then over the years, more and more Screaming Mummies were discovered. And this became a huge mystery. Were they buried alive or tortured? Why did they look like that? Researchers had no idea for the longest time. Now, the mummy that Dier was analyzing, he assumed that he had just been poisoned and his mouth was open because when the poison was slowly kicking into effect, he knew what was happening and was shocked. But new evidence suggests that he was actually hung. But turns out that most of these mummies look like they're screaming because they were poorly wrapped. Yep, it's as simple as that. The jaw wasn't wrapped tight enough, so the mouth ended up naturally falling open. 
Nonetheless, they look a thousand times creepier than other mummies. Making our way down the list number six, we have the bog bodies. Over 15 years ago, a group of archaeologists were exploring an area in Scotland when they came across some very creepy bodies. The bodies were of one female and one male who died about 3,000 years ago. But because of the state that they were in, it was believed that their bodies were thrown into a bog where they mummified for about 300 to 600 years. After that, they were taken out and buried. But something was off about these bodies. The woman's jaw was too large for her skull, and the man's limbs were off. Well, turns out that these bodies were the combination of six different people fused together, like some sort of Frankenstein monster. The female was combined with body parts from several other people who died around the same time as her, whereas the male had body parts from people who died hundreds of years before him. And the bones weren't just pushed together, no, they were actually attached properly. So why would someone do this and who did this? It's so creepy. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the sacrifices. Now, it's not new news that the Aztecs were a big fan of bloody sacrifices, but it's still quite shocking to come across sacrificial burial spots, because this next find revealed just how gruesome these rituals can get. So in 2004, a team discovered a number of decapitated and mutilated bodies outside of Mexico City. The bodies belonged to humans and animals. These rituals were performed as a way to feed the gods. It was believed that if you let the gods go hungry, then the sun would stop rising and the world would come to its end. In this burial spot, they found several skulls stuck together on a post, and others with holes in their head that were once used for decoration. I mean, it may not look so bad now, but imagine back in the day when the skulls still had the victim's skin and eyes and hair on it. Eey. In our fourth spot, we have the sunken skulls. In 2009, while excavating a dry lake bed in Motala, Sweden, a bunch of strange artifacts were found. There was a pile of animal bones, stone tools, and a bunch of skulls with stakes plunged through their heads. These skulls are 8,000 years old, and experts have no clue what happened to them. In fact, there's even one skull that has pieces of other skulls shoved up inside of it. Yeah, pretty disgusting. They think that this was either part of their funeral practices, or it was created as some sort of trophy by warriors who defeated their opponents. Moving on to number three, we have the shackled skeletons. In 2016, a group of 80 skeletons were found buried in Athens, Greece. But these skeletons were found chained up with iron shackles still around their wrists. They are believed to be prisoners who died around 650 BC and 625 BC. These skeletons were found with terrified expressions plastered on their faces. Their necks were flexed and their jaws hung wide open. Studies showed that all the skeletons were males who suffered horrific deaths. They were chained up while an executioner went down the line, killing these men one by one while the others watched, waiting their turn. They were ruthless back in the day. I just want to know what these men did. In our second spot, we have the expedition bones. Back in 1845, Sir John Franklin led two ships filled with 129 men to explore the Canadian Arctic in search of the Northwest Passage. However, along the way, the ships ended up getting stuck in ice, and they all faced a chilling death. But thanks to the ice, the bodies of the crewmen were preserved. In the 1980s and the 1990s, researchers recovered the remains of the crew on King William Island, and they found some pretty terrifying things. It was thought that the crew resorted to cannibalism for their last couple of days. They had food aboard the ship, but many were sick from scurvy, tuberculosis, hypothermia, and pneumonia, which made them disoriented and a little wild. The crew were found with cut marks all over their body, indicating that their flesh was cut off the bones and eaten. On other men, their bones had been cracked open and the bone marrow was feasted on. What a very gruesome death. 
And in our number one spot, we have the severed hands. While doing a number of digs in Abaris, Egypt, one archaeologist found four different pits filled with severed hands. Yep, nothing else, just piles and piles of hands. Each hand belonged to a different person, and they had been buried there 3,600 years ago. Now, before you think there's like some morbid hand serial killer on the loose, no, there actually is an explanation for this. But I don't think it makes it less creepy. So back in the day, it was a practice to actually remove the hand of your enemy. It was thought that by doing so, you would steal their power. You then could trade these hands in for a reward. The hands were then buried into these ceremonial pits. I'm just glad that this isn't a practice anymore. Starting off our list today, we have the fact that Neanderthals often partook in cannibalism, but not for the nutritional value of their fellow man. So then why was it common practice for Neanderthals to eat other Neanderthals? Well, scientists have a few theories, but first let's talk about how they came to the conclusion of cannibalism in the first place. Cut marks made by stone tools were found on the skeletons of completely dismembered Neanderthals. Neanderthal skeletons, as well as finger bones were discovered with bite marks that are consistent with marks created by Neanderthal teeth. So why did they do it? Well, considering the fact that Neanderthals had very little meat on their bones and that what little meat they have would have lacked the necessary vitamins and minerals needed for survival, scientists believe that the act of cannibalism amongst Neanderthals was much more symbolic. One possible explanation is that Neanderthals ate other Neanderthals to instill fear into enemy tribes tribes attempting to trespass on their territories, or perhaps they ate the enemy tribes themselves in a victory feast after defeating them in war. Another less dark explanation would be that Neanderthals might have eaten their dead relatives as a way to have them live on inside of the living members of their tribe. Nice. So, Neanderthals are often depicted looking pretty much exactly like modern day humans, just with bigger brow ridges and more animal pelts. But a few years back, a much freakier depiction of Neanderthals, or Neanderthals, I know there's some people who think it's Neanderthal, Neanderthal. Anyway, a depiction of Neanderthals was presented by author Danny Vendramini, who also has an interest in evolutionary biology. He wrote a book called Them and Us, How Neanderthal Predation Created Modern Humans. Humans. The main thesis is that Neanderthals weren't these peaceful dummies that we preyed on and killed off. Instead, they were the ones hunting us. He believed Neanderthals were apex predators, the stuff of nightmares, and that they looked a little bit more like this. Yeah, big, mean looking ape monsters. And he makes some pretty interesting points. I mean, for one, they did have thicker bones than us. They were stockier, stronger. We know from studying their teeth that they hunted and ate meat. He also looked at the shape and size of their eye sockets, theorizing that based on how large they were, it's possible they were able to see in the dark, which is freaky if it's true. Or at least, you know, they had better vision at night than we did. And because these Neanderthals terrorized us for thousands of years, we have this fear of big hairy beasts just etched into our collective psyche. Now, there's a lot of debate here. His book is kind of controversial in the anthropology world, but it's a pretty killer idea. It would make for an awesome movie. Next on our list, we have the fact that we got a lot wrong about the true nature of Neanderthals, which is pretty disturbing when you think about how much work and tax dollars went into a bunch of scientists coming to the wrong conclusion despite years of research and an endless stream of resources, but whatever. At one point in time, it was believed, as James just stated, that both Neanderthals and humans lived completely separately and that Neanderthals were savages, but research shows that that was just simply not the case. In fact, Neanderthals, like humans, were incredibly resilient and knowledgeable and able to adapt to a wide range of climates. They were also, as James did mention, incredibly skilled and organized hunters who thrived on a certain kind of tribal societal order. But here's the thing. In in many instances, Neanderthals did actually live side by side with humans, and they bred with them too, which is why so many of us alive today actually do have traces of Neanderthal DNA. Although not all instances of adult encounters were 
consensual, but more on that in a bit. In 2018, the bones of a young Neanderthal were discovered, and not only were they the oldest human remains discovered in Poland, the poor thing suffered a pretty brutal death. It had been eaten by some massive prehistoric bird. Man, imagine roaming around at a time where there were birds so big uh, they could eat you. And all you'd be armed with is a sharp rock attached to a stick. They were finger bones found in a cave in Poland. They had been digested. Unfortunately, the bones were too poorly preserved to conduct any DNA analysis, but the lead archaeologist, Paweł Valde Nowak, believes they belonged to a very young Neanderthal, stating they came from a very deep layer of the cave, a few meters below the present surface, a layer that also contained the typical stone tools that would have been used by Neanderthals. Okay, so I know in my last point I literally just mentioned the fact that Neanderthals were much more sophisticated than we had previously theorized, and while that is true, it doesn't mean that they didn't do some seriously messed up things. It is believed that for over 50,000 years, while some Neanderthal tribes lived peacefully amongst humans, others did not, and those who did not were pretty brutal about it. Turns out Neanderthals who didn't want to hang out with humans still wanted something to do with them, and that that something is SEX. Scientists believe that in many cases Neanderthals killed and ate human men while forcing human women into intimate adult encounters. Some scientists also theorize that there was a time in which humans were almost completely wiped out by Neanderthals, but luckily humans fought back, and they fought back hard, and they were able to rebuild their civilization and ultimately prevail. But when Neanderthals weren't uh, attacking us for our bodies, they were uh looking at the ones around them. Inbreeding, it's something that we kind of frown upon today, to say the least, but throughout history, it was more common than we're comfortable enough to admit, and Neanderthals were no exception, which is gross, but not really shocking in the slightest. There are tons of theories as to how the Neanderthals finally died out. Some researchers think inbreeding could have played a big role. Inbreeding among Neanderthals was common. They often mated with close relatives like cousins, even siblings. This was discovered through analysis of bones and DNA. For example, a Neanderthal toe bone found in Siberia showed that its parents were closely related. So this would have caused problems for them, just like it does in humans today. They had body parts and bones that didn't develop properly, like misshapen kneecaps and vertebrae. Some even kept baby teeth into adulthood. Because of these issues, inbred Neanderthals were, of course, weaker and had a harder time having offspring of their own compared to early humans. Next up, we have got the fact that it is incredibly possible that Neanderthals did in fact partake in ritual sacrifice, but not the sacrifice of humans as far as we know. In 1921, bear remains were found inside of a cave in Drachenloch, Switzerland, suggesting the possibility of ritual sacrifices performed by Neanderthals and giving way to the myth of the cult of cave bear. After the discovery, some archaeologists came to the conclusion that the findings meant one thing, and one thing only, that the bears killed in the Swiss cave had been part of a coming-of-age slash rite-of-passage ritual performed by young male Neanderthals wanting to prove themselves to their tribe. While that theory is yet to be proved, and very well likely never will be, it's an interesting one nonetheless. So if you need any more proof as to why Neanderthals were scarier than we often think, uh, let's take a look, talk a bit more about some of these animals they hunted, like the cave bear and the cave lion. I don't think it gets any more ferocious than prehistoric lions and bears. Cave bears were about the same size as modern day brown bears, sometimes larger though, likely weighing in at over 1,500 pounds, bones of cave lions have been found all over Europe, with the biggest specimens being over 8 feet in length, and that's not even counting the tail. Terrifying. And what's cool is that along with these bones, cave paintings have been found, which gives us a pretty good idea of what these animals would have looked like. Cave lions, for example, didn't look like they had manes of any kind. So yeah, thanks to all our proto-human ancestors for documenting that for us. Next up, we have another theory that hits pretty close to home, depending on your beliefs, I suppose, and that is that the Neanderthals were wiped out due to climate change, and a rising in the human population, and disease, and a decline in biodiversity. Sound familiar? When humans began spreading out over the globe, they became a serious threat to not only Neanderthals, but also the large animals that made up the majority of the Neanderthals' diet, as well as the forest, jungle, and grassland areas that those large animals relied on to survive. You see, 
Humans are not great at sustainability, and so they were killing these large animals at a rate in which they could not recover from. After that, they began wiping out lush areas of trees and grass that the planet so desperately needed to maintain itself. The climate began to change, making it incredibly difficult for Neanderthals to survive. Not only that, but as humans continued to spread across continents, they also spread their diseases. Diseases that, as James said, the inbred Neanderthal immune systems were just not strong enough to fight off. The combination of a declining ecosystem leading to immanageable climate change as well as deadly disease is ultimately what led to the extinction of the species. So I guess you have us to thank? But Neanderthals didn't die out entirely. There are traces of their DNA in us. Unless you're just straight up African, it's likely you have some Neanderthal DNA in you, especially if you're of East Asian or European descent. As Hannah discussed earlier, Neanderthals and modern day humans did interbreed, willingly or not, and some of that DNA still lingers in us to this day. These Neanderthal genes in our DNA can affect things like our immune systems, our skin, our hair, and there are some negative traits believed to have been passed down as well. Traits and adaptations that would have helped Neanderthals 40 thousand years ago as they were migrating to new non-African environments but aren't super helpful now like sun sensitivity. Apparently people with higher amounts of Neanderthal DNA have higher risks of sun sensitivity. I don't know if this is just a myth or not but I always heard that if you're someone who looks at the sun and then you sneeze you might have higher Neanderthal amounts of their DNA in you. I'd always sneeze when I look at the sun. And apparently higher Neanderthal DNA could also be linked with higher rates of depression. So that's all very interesting. Number 10, astronaut sightings. Who better to trust about what's going on in space than people who have actually been to space before? That's right, numerous astronauts over the years have reported seeing things that they think might be UFOs. Buzz Aldrin was one of the astronauts aboard the Apollo 11, and during their journey, they all reported seeing flying objects. Of course, space debris exists, and it could just be some metal junk that was adrift in space. But then, why did they report that the objects appeared? to be following them. When they thought that it might have just been a detached part of the rocket that was flying alongside them, they were informed that this piece was actually 6,000 miles away from them, and they definitely wouldn't have been able to see it from that far away. He also said that when they brought it up, they were briefed to not talk about what they had seen out in space. Well, the government can try all they want to cover things up, but eventually, word always gets out. Number 9. Paintings now let's go well beyond spaceships and astronauts and move into the far more distant past, because alien sightings certainly aren't a new thing and seem to have been around for centuries. One piece of evidence that people often cite is a painting titled The Madonna with Saint Giovannino. It was painted in the 15th century by Dominic Gerlando and appears to depict a UFO flying around in the background, its shape matching up with people's frequent depictions of flying saucers as being alien spacecrafts. There also appeared to be beams of light coming out from the bottom of the ship and this has led people to believe that it is unmistakably an alien craft and not just something else placed up in the sky. And if you take a look at it, it does seem hard to believe that it could be anything else as what other dark object would make sense to be floating in the sky like that? If you have any ideas, let me know what else you think it might be. Number 8. The Tic Tac UFO Back in 2004 on the coast of California, a US Navy pilot named David Fravor reported seeing something strange. In fact, he reported seeing something that was, quote, something not from this earth. They were about 60 to 100 miles off the coast of California, and he was leading a strike fighter squadron through some exercises when the incident occurred. He said that he saw a tic tac shaped vessel flying through the air at incredible speeds, but it wasn't just him who saw it. It was also reported by another flight crew who actually followed after the craft and even filmed it. While the footage was originally kept classified, it's now been made available to the public. The case was then published by the New York Times after the Pentagon acknowledged its Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program, which is actually the Pentagon's own 21st century study of UFO sightings. Number 7. Wow! Exclamation point. The Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, otherwise known as SETI, is a group that, well, searches for extraterrestrial intelligence. In 1977, a large radio telescope outside of Ohio was scanning the skies on behalf of SETI when they picked up a signal that lasted for 72 seconds. The 
printouts of readings often included low numbers, which was typically just the background noise that the telescope picked up. But then a scientist noticed that there was a sudden string of letters as well as larger numbers. The letters went all the way up to U, which indicated a signal 30 times stronger than the typical background noise. Upon seeing these consecutive letters, which would represent a very strong signal and something potentially alien, he circled them and wrote the word wow, followed by an exclamation point in bright red pen. To this day, we've never really seen anything else like it, and the extraordinary readout has yet to ever be duplicated. Number 6. Viking Mars Now let's get into some more sciencey factual stuff. When people think of aliens, the term that might often come to mind is Martians, being attributed specifically to aliens that reside on the planet of Mars. NASA has sent a lot of things out there, and one expedition was referred to as Viking, them sending out little robots to take readings of the planet. One test that they performed was done on the soil, mixing soil with radioactive carbon labeled nutrients to see if they would produce radio radioactive methane gas, this being a chemical sign of life on other planets. And it did, the test coming back with a positive result and finding organic molecules. But NASA just brushed it off I guess, because they said that the other experiments didn't end up with the same results, so they just said it was a false positive. But one of the original scientists and others who have analyzed the data stand by their discovery saying that the other experiments had just been ill-equipped for performing the tests and finding the same results. Number 5. Martian Fossil Let's hear from NASA again, this event taking place in 1996 when they announced that they had found a Martian fossil. They said that they had found fossilized microbes within a lump of Martian rock, a meteorite that is theorized to have been blasted off the planet around 15 million years ago before finally winding up in Antarctica where it was discovered 12 years prior in 1996. They analyzed it a lot, of course, and found organic molecules as well as small bits of the mineral known as magnetite, which can sometimes be found in Earth bacteria. Researchers also said that under an electron microscope, they were able to see traces of nanobacteria. So it seems like evidence is continuing to stack up that other planets are, or used to be, capable of sustaining life. And with a universe as infinitely large as ours, it's hard to say that it's impossible that life on other planets could could ever exist. Number 4. The Super Hornet Let's now take a look at another piece of evidence that came out following the Pentagon's acknowledgement of their Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program. This took place back in 2015 on the East Coast and is another video of evidence discovered by the US Navy, this time by a FA-18 Super Hornet, a strike fighter that reaches speeds of up to 2,000 kilometers an hour. That's pretty fast. The pilots see the unidentified object moving at incredibly high speeds over the water and they struggle to keep up but are finally able to get a lock on it. When they do, they start cheering and one even says, what the F is that thing? They continue to follow it and seem to be unable to figure out what it possibly could be. This is another piece of evidence that had to go through a declassification process before it could be released to the public. Makes you wonder what other video footage and potential signs of alien life the government might be hiding from us in a file cabinet labeled classified. Number 3. Chicago O'Hare In November 2006, in Chicago, Illinois, airline staff and pilots alike were shocked by what they had witnessed. Multiple people reported seeing what they described as a flying saucer in the air. It was an overcast day and the UFO seemed to be just hovering over the Chicago O'Hare airport terminal. They then described how it seemed to shoot up into the air incredibly quickly, so fast that it punched a hole through the cloud cover above it. The FAA or Federal Aviation Administration described it as simply being a strange weather phenomenon and they wouldn't be investigating it, so don't worry about it. Of course, that's what they want us to think. But so many people at once reporting seeing a flying saucer shooting through the clouds doesn't really sound like a weather phenomenon to me. One flight traffic control official said, To fly 7 million light years to O'Hare and then have to turn around and go home because your gate was occupied is simply unacceptable. Number 2. SETI Readings now, now let's go back to the SETI project again. If you've somehow already forgotten by now, that refers to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Back in 2003, they were using a large telescope in Puerto Rico to re-examine around 200 sections of the sky that had all previously shown unexplained radio signals. All 
of the signals had disappeared except for one which had actually become stronger. It came from a spot between the constellations Pisces and Aries where there aren't any known stars or planets. The signal was emitting the frequency for hydrogen, the most common element which both absorbs and emits energy. Some astronomers believing that this is the most likely element aliens might use to send a message to us for this reason. The signal from this spot in space has now been recorded a total of three times and has left many people wondering if it is truly a signal coming from aliens. Number 1. The Phoenix Lights On March 13th in 1997, an event took place that was referred to as Lights Over Phoenix or the Phoenix Lights Phenomenon. On this day, hundreds of witnesses reported seeing otherworldly lights across Arizona, Nevada, and northern Mexico. There were two main events, the first being a giant V-shaped aircraft that had five lights on it, maybe thrusters, though it apparently didn't make any sound. Then later that night, there were a series of red and orange lights in the sky that didn't appear to move at all. And while air traffic control employees could see the lights in the sky, they couldn't see them on their radars. The governor of the state of Arizona at the time said, I'm a pilot and I know just about every machine that flies. It was bigger than anything I've ever seen. It remains a great mystery. And it really does remain a mystery. To this day, nobody seems to have any real or solid explanation for what the large spacecraft and the lights might have been. It was said that it was a military flare drop, but this came after their original original statement that they had had no planes in the air. And even a recreation of the event didn't line up with what people had seen, flares flickering and burning out after only a few seconds. I have an explanation though, it was aliens. It's about weird discoveries that fishermen made out at sea. These discoveries are so creepy that they will actually blow your mind. Where did they come from? Click the video now to find out more.